This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Charles Ponzi allegedly once said, I went looking for trouble and I found it. Truer words were never spoken. From an early age, Ponzi discovered that hard work and book learning were not for him. He was always involved in one scheme after another, hoping that someday he would find the one thing that would make him rich beyond his wildest dreams. He turns out to be right. One day, Charles Ponzi was struck by a lightning bolt of perfidious inspiration and set in motion one of the most brazen and ambitious cons in history. The basic concept behind the swindle even took his name. Sure, people like Lou Palman and Bernie Madoff employed the fraud to a far greater success, and as we will find out, he wasn't even the first one to do it. But even today, the con is still remembered as the Ponzi scheme. The con man lured his victims with the simple but irresistible promise of quick and easy money. But this was one temptation that Ponzi himself could not control. He kept on scheming and plotting, even when his walls of lies were crashing down around around him, and the end was inevitable. Ultimately, his deceitful ways cost him everything – his money, his wife, his friends, his freedom – and he ended up dying penniless in a charity hospital in Brazil. Today, we look at Charles Ponzi, the con man who experienced the highest of highs, followed by the lowest of lows. Charles Ponzi was born Carlo Pietro Giovanni Guglielmo Tobaldo Ponzi on March 3, 1882, in the town of Lugo in northern Italy. His parents were Oreste and Demelda Ponzi. A lot of information on Ponzi's early years comes from the man himself from interviews that he gave after he became a national celebrity, as well as his boastful autobiography. As you might imagine, there is an inherent risk when you take a con man at his word, but we have little choice here. According to Ponzi, his family was once well off and lived in Parma, but had fallen on hard times prior to his birth. At one point, he relocated to Rome and took on odd jobs before being accepted to the Sapienza University of Rome. By his own admission, Ponzi was not exactly a conscientious student. Instead, he preferred to hang around bars and cafes with his rich friends. As he put it, spending money seemed the most attractive thing on earth. Unsurprisingly, the good times did not last long, and after a few years, Ponzi was forced to leave the university with no money and no diploma. He heard stories of other Italians who went off to America to find fame and fortune, and decided that this was the only course open to him. On November 15, in 1903, Charles Ponzi arrived in Boston Harbor aboard the SS Vancouver. Again, going by his account, he only had $2.50 in his pockets because he lost the rest of his money playing cards during the transatlantic crossing. However, he did have $1 million in hopes. Even so, his climb towards the top was long and slow, and it started with a bunch of odd jobs up and down the East Coast. He worked as a busboy, a waiter, a sign painter, but never lasted in one position long because he always got in trouble for stealing or trying to cheat the customers. After a few years of this, Ponzi moved to Canada and settled in Montreal. In 1907, he found a job as an assistant teller with Zerossi Bank, a new business open to cater to the recent influx of Italian immigrants. Here, Ponzi managed to rise through the ranks quickly because he was charming and outgoing and could speak multiple languages. He might have been able to launch a successful career as a banker if not for the fact that the owner of the bank, Luigi Zerossi, was operating his own scam. He attracted new clients with generous interest rates on bank deposits, except that he was paying on those interests using the money deposited into new accounts. Meanwhile, he used the profits for real estate loans. Eventually, the scheme failed and Zerossi Rossi fled to Mexico. Ponzi was once again penniless. He forged a check for $223.58 and got caught. 
He ended up serving three years at St. Vincent de Paul Federal Penitentiary in Montreal before returning to the United States. Back in Boston, it did not take long for Ponzi to get involved in another criminal endeavor. This time, it was smuggling Italian immigrants across the border. He was caught again and spent another two years in prison. After becoming a free man again, it seems that Ponzi tried to walk the straight and narrow, at least for a little while. Perhaps part of the reason was Rose Gnetso, a young woman he met on a streetcar one day and fell in love with. Ponzi wooed her endlessly, and soon enough, the innocent girl was enamored with his charm and apparent sophistication. The two got married in 1918. During that time, Ponzi worked first as a teller for a broker, J.R. Poole, and afterwards left to take over his father-in-law's grocery store. Neither endeavor proved successful, and soon enough, Charles Ponzi was looking for a new get-rich-quick scheme. Even if you've never heard of Charles Ponzi before this video, chances are that you are at least familiar with the scam that shares his name, the Ponzi Scheme. But what exactly does it involve? A Ponzi scheme is an investment fraud that relies on the old adage, rob Peter to pay Paul. The basics of the con involve paying off the dividends of older investors with money from new investors. People think their money gets invested wisely in profitable business ventures and that the person in charge is really just rather good at their job. Most of the funds, however, go straight into the pocket of the schemer. In exchange, the victims get some money back, which in their minds represents the profits that they made from legitimate transactions. As far as they are concerned, the bulk of their investment is still safe and sound, not realizing that it's already gone, used to pay off other investors, and to finance a luxurious lifestyle for the con artist. The biggest drawback of the Ponzi scheme is that it requires a constant flow of new investors to pay off the earlier ones. If the well runs dry, the scam falls apart. That is why these swindlers do their best to ensure a steady supply of new funds by promising huge profits with no risks. This turns the scam into a bit of a vicious cycle. The more profits the con man pays out, the more new money needs to come in, which in turn raises the amount of profits being paid out, which results in the need for new investors, and so the cycle continues. Once a Ponzi scheme is set in motion, it doesn't really stop until it crashes and burns and the fraud is exposed. Even so, a skillful con man can keep it going for years, even decades. There is usually no shortage of people unable to resist the allure of fast and easy money. The Ponzi scheme gets generally mixed up with the pyramid scheme, and although the two are very similar, there are a few key differences. Most importantly, in the Ponzi scheme, the fraudster acts as a sole operator and interacts with all of his targets directly. In a pyramid scheme, however, participants need to recruit others into the fray in order to gain any benefits, thus creating a layer of separation between them and the original fraudster every time. Moreover, a Ponzi scheme promises the victims profits through obscure methods of investment, while pyramid scheme participants know from the outset that their returns come from signing up new members. Generally, a Ponzi scheme is more durable because it requires fewer people to stay afloat. Although Charles Ponzi's name is inexorably attached to this type of con, he was not the first to employ it. A former German actress named Adele Spitzetter might lay claim to that title after opening a bank in 1871 and using this method to pay off her investors. Her scam lasted a little over a year, but was soon followed by Austrian Johann Baptist Placht, whose fraud was discovered in 1874. In America, Sarah Howe might be the first to employ this technique. In 1879, she opened a bank named the Ladies' Deposit Company in Boston, which offered large interest rates on deposits. She claimed to have backing from a Quaker charity, but was simply using money from new depositors to pay off the interest rates. Another notable swindler was William 520% Miller, who operated the Franklin Syndicate. He defrauded $1 million in 1890s money before being caught. There are some red flags which the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, say can help investors avoid Ponzi schemes. They include the promise of unreasonably high returns with no risk, consistent returns regardless of the state of the market, shady paperwork, unlicensed sellers, and secretive or complex investment strategies. If it sounds too good to be true, well, it usually is. 
Except, of course, when it comes to today's sponsor, Squarespace. If you thought making a website was complex and expensive, just not something you could do, well, think again. Now, maybe you've got some idea for a website or a business or a Ponzi scheme or something else knocking around in your mind. Just kidding about the Ponzi scheme thing. Don't do that. Well, it's about time you stopped sitting on that idea and you got it out into the world. Now, that might be scary, but, you know, new things are. But not knowing how to set up a website is not an excuse. No excuses available with Squarespace, which make it incredibly easy to set up a website. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. Want to sell something online? Easy. Podcast? Absolutely. Starting a YouTube channel? Well, obviously you do that on YouTube, but you'll want a website to complement it. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content, or you can start from scratch, or easily move over from an existing domain, making everything super easy to manage. Don't start from scratch, though. That's my advice. Just use one of their beautiful templates. Like I said, no excuses with Squarespace. And once you've gone through the super easy customization process, there's no updates, there's no patches. There's no tech BS to deal with. And Squarespace also handles all of the website-y stuff. Like I said, there's podcasts, but they also do mailing lists, social integrations, all of that good stuff. And of course, 24-7 customer support if you need it. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And let's get back to Mr. Ponzi. Now we have a general idea of what a Ponzi scheme is, how exactly did Charles Ponzi's specific scam work? Well, it was based around a special postal coupon known as an International Relay Coupon, or IRC. It was introduced in 1906, and it was meant to be exchanged for the postage stamp necessary to send one single-rate ordinary delivery between two countries which were members of the Universal Postal Union, or UNU. In other words, a person from the United States, let's call him Jack, sends a letter to Marie in France. He wanted a reply, but was not expecting Marie to spend her own money on postage stamps to write back to him. Therefore, he also included with the original letter an IRC which he bought in the US, which Marie could redeem in her own country for the postage necessary to send back another letter. Ponzi had never heard of these coupons until he received one from a company in Spain. He had written many letters to businesses in Europe presenting various ideas of his, and this company wrote back to him and included an IRC for his reply. Whatever money-making pitch Ponzi originally made to the Spanish company was quickly forgotten because he had a new idea. Ponzi realized that inflation, mainly caused by World War I, meant there was a slight but noticeable difference in the value of the stamps which were exchanged using IRCs. The redemption rate of these coupons was fixed through an international treaty, but one could theoretically make a profit if they bought IRCs in a different country using currency that had fallen against the dollar, then exchanging them for stamps in the United States and then selling those stamps in US currency. Ponzi could, for example, buy an IRC in a Spanish post office worth 30 centavos. He could then exchange it in the US for a stamp worth 5 cents and make a 10% profit. If he scaled up this operation, he could earn substantial dividends. The profit would be even greater if he bought IRCs from the countries with the highest inflation. Basically, what Ponzi wanted was a type of arbitrage, which simply means purchasing something in one market and then selling it in another market where the price is higher. This was not only common and profitable, but it was also perfectly legal. Ponzi had his sales pitch, and now he needed people to invest. He made bold claims of having agents all over Europe who were buying up IRCs in bulk and sending them back to him so he could exchange and sell them for a profit. He boasted that he could provide returns on investment of 50% in 45 days or 100% in 90 days. Any requests for additional details would have been denied on the basis that it could help the competition. In reality, setting up such an operation would have been so costly that it would have completely negated any profits made from selling IRCs. Not to mention the fact that there were nowhere near enough postal coupons in the world world to sustain a business the size that Ponzi's would reach. But these weren't details that concerned his clients. At first, Ponzi tried the banks, but they were not biting and refused to grant him loans for this new business. However, he found considerably more success simply appealing to the general population who proved more inclined to believe his tales of easy riches. At first, he mainly appealed to friends and acquaintances. Like his biographer Donald Dunn argued, Ponzi's biggest talent had nothing to do with being good with finances, but rather being good with people. 
people. He made sure not to be too aggressive with his pitches. He casually flaunted his success and only went into detail when pressed by others. Then, if they absolutely insisted, he would take their money. In January 1920, Ponzi started the Securities Exchange Company. By then, the money had begun rolling in, and the swindler had a supply of investors. Launching his own business was the natural next step, as well as a necessary move in order to attract new clients and keep delivering those promised returns. Soon enough, he relocated to a bigger office on Boston School Street, the site of the first public school in the United States. It wasn't long before Ponzi was handling millions of dollars from tens of thousands of investors. People were lining up around the block to give their money to this financial wizard who came out of nowhere and had the secret to untold wealth. At the height of his success, Ponzi was making around $250,000 a day. Obviously, this newfound success allowed him to indulge in a lavish lifestyle. He bought a spacious 12-room mansion in Lexington, Massachusetts. He rode around town in a custom-built chauffeured limousine wearing expensive tailored suits with diamond tie pins and carrying around a gold-handled cane. Some of his more lavish expenditures included buying a bank which had previously rejected his loan application, as well as Poole's brokerage firm, where he used to work, just so that he could fire his former boss. The good times lasted less than a year for Ponzi before he got caught, and looking back, it's surprising that it even took that long. He might have been an incredible salesman, but Ponzi was not a skilled financier like Bernie Madoff, for example, who could keep his scam going for decades. In fact, Ponzi's own publicist later called him a financial idiot who couldn't even add. His scheme did not stand up to scrutiny from a person who knew what they were talking about. However, Ponzi managed to delay investigations first by successfully suing a financial writer for libel, which acted as a deterrent to other journalists, and then by sweet-talking state officials and easing their growing suspicions. Ponzi's world came tumbling down in the summer of 1920, mostly courtesy of the Boston Post, which even won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service for their exposure of Ponzi's operations. However, credit is also due to William McMaster's The Man and Ponzi hired as his publicist shortly before his downfall. At first, the relationship between the three started off great. One of McMaster's first acts as Ponzi's publicist was to schedule him an interview with the Boston Post, which at the time had the largest circulation in New England. On July the 24th, a piece on Ponzi appeared on the newspaper's front page. It detailed his rags to riches story and how he was able to provide all of his investors with amazing returns that no other financier could come close to. On July the 26th, a Monday, Ponzi went to his office to find a massive line of people waiting to give him their money. In just that one day, Ponzi collected over $3 million, which is about $34 million in today's money. This huge success it came with drawbacks as it made Ponzi front page news all over the country. The Boston Post, in particular, now had a strong interest in him. Concurrently, McMasters began doubting his clients' claims, realizing it would have been impossible for anyone to deliver the type of returns that Ponzi promised. Eventually, McMasters became convinced that his client was a fraud and began working with the Post to expose him. The newspaper's acting publisher, Richard Grosier, was initially wary of the idea because he feared a lawsuit, but McMasters got him on board with the help of district attorney Nathan Tufts, who promised him immunity from lawsuits if the ex expose proved false. On August the 2nd, the Boston Post ran a first-person account written by McMasters, which had the headline, Declares Ponzi is now hopelessly insolvent. The publicist proclaimed that Ponzi was at least $2 million in debt and up to $4.5 million if you took into account the interest on his outstanding notes. The downfall it came very quick for Ponzi. He tried reassuring his investors and lashing out at his accusers, but there was no way to stop the government auditors from looking at his books. On August the 11th, the Post further hurried his demise by revealing that Ponzi spent time in prison in Canada for forging checks. An official report from the U.S. Post Office revealed that Ponzi never cashed in any IRCs in the United States, while an audit concluded that he was $3 million, later revised to $7 million, in debt. Charles Ponzi was arrested on federal charges of mail fraud. His downfall led to the collapse of six banks and caused the financial ruin of tens of thousands of people who received less than 30 cents on the dollar on their investments.
Initially, Ponzi only served three and a half years in prison before being released on parole. However, he was immediately arrested again on state charges of larceny and sentenced to another seven to nine years in prison. Ponzi appealed the state conviction and was released on bail until the matter was settled. He immediately fled to Massachusetts and ended up in Jacksonville, Florida. Despite the complete collapse of his financial house of cards, Ponzi had no intention of turning straight. As he said in his autobiography, no man is ever licked unless he wants to be. And I didn't intend to stay licked. He immediately got started on another scam, which meant to take advantage of the real estate boom in Florida. He founded the Charpon Land Syndicate and sold property to oblivious investors who were lured in by Ponzi's charm and his promises of huge returns on valuable tracts of land in just a few months. What they soon discovered was that what they actually purchased was worthless swampland and property that was actually underwater. Ponzi was arrested again, however, before the authorities fully realized who they were dealing with, he posted bail and went on the run once more. This was was one too many close calls for the con man, and he decided to escape to Italy. He shaved his head and moustache and secured passage as a crewman aboard a merchant ship headed for Europe. However, his identity was discovered, and Ponzi was arrested in the port of New Orleans. This time, there was no more escaping for the supreme swindler. He served seven years in prison, was released in 1934, and then was deported to Italy because Ponzi never actually obtained his American citizenship. The final years of his life are not well documented because they were not covered in his autobiography and also because the world lost interest in Charles Ponzi. The man who left prison was not the same one who entered it. Ponzi had lost his youth, his confidence, and his guile. His wife did not follow him to Italy, and they divorced a few years later. Ponzi didn't last long in his motherland and ended up in Brazil. According to one version of events, this was because he got caught conning people again and had to go on the run. Another version said that a cousin of his who worked in the Air Force got him a job with an airline that ran flights between Italy and Brazil. The gig only lasted a few years, though, as the fledgling airline was closed when Brazil sided with the Allies during World War II. Charles Ponzi spent the last few years of his life in squalor, working as a teacher and translator to make ends meet. A stroke left him partially blind and paralyzed. He died on January 18, 1949, in a charity hospital in Rio de Janeiro, leaving behind barely enough money to cover his burial. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit the thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. We got brand new videos four times a week. Also, why not check out our sister channel, Geographics. This channel is about people. That channel is about places. It is linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.